Hello and welcome everybody to today's talk about the art of landscape photography. My name is Martin Kluge and I'm here as a representative of the Art Photography Gallery in Cape Town. And I'm really excited today to have two very successful photographers with me who work out of Cape Town. Let me introduce first Hohart Malan, landscape Thank photographer. You. Welcome. And my friend, gallery owner, photographer, artist, you name it, Martin Osner. Welcome. Hi, Martin. Thank you. Good. I'm very good. Um, gentlemen, today's talk is fascinating for me before, because I, as a fellow photographer, um, have never really tapped into the big world of landscape photography. But you guys have, and you are actively producing and selling. So what I would like to do today is um, uncover your, both of your approaches to this kind of art and find out the underlying DNA um, of both of your works side by side, if that makes any sense. Sure. Just before we start, we will, um, just for the audience, we will not actually go very deeply into technical questions regarding camera equipments and settings, but rather focus on the artistic process of the, uh, behind the work, also because of, we have a lot of art lovers and clients watching, so it's not, that's not getting too technical. Um, Gentlemen, before we dive in the deep end of this conversation, uh, Martin, I just wanted to um, explain that you explain your work relationship. How do you guys meet? I mean, a lot of people of the audience have never been to your beautiful galleries. They haven't seen your work live where you represent your work, but also Hohart's work and other artists. Can yes. you just tell us how you met? Yeah, with pleasure, Martin. I um, for a while now, I've been aware of Hochart's work. In fact, I was introduced to uh, his work through my daughter, Samantha. Uh, she follows uh, Hochart uh, on social media. And very often, she'd be coming to me and say, you must see the work that, uh, that Hochart Malone is posting. And uh, she would show me, and it was impressive, and so on. But I didn't think that much about it. And then uh, I also teach photography, and, and so does Hochart. And, and uh, we obviously have students who have been, you know, with both of us. Yeah. And I'd be teaching a course and I'd be saying a few things and the student would say to me, no, 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 that's, that's not what Hochart says. You know, <laughs> so, so his name was now coming up in the lecture room as well. And um, I think Hochart, it was, um, it was at the exhibition at the end of, of last year yeah. that uh, we met you. Hochart came through to have a look at the work and we finally got to meet face to face. And it, wasn't, it was shortly after that that we invited him into the circle of trust and we invited him in to, to be represented by our gallery and, and that's where we are today. Great. Okay, let's start the journey. Hohart, you told me in the beginning um, you are not shooting any other subject matter, which is really interesting for me. So how, where did landscape photography start for you? I think my love of landscape photography originated mainly from my dad and his brothers being obsessed with plants, but specifically indigenous flora. So all of our holidays where most people would go to either the sea or they would go to wildlife parks, all of our holidays centered in some way around chasing flowers. So we would also go to parks and wilderness areas, but um, it was more, as I say, lands landscape oriented than particularly wildlife oriented yeah. um, and I'm also a, a major introvert so um, I like shooting things that it can't talk back to me so <laughs> landscapes um, yeah are the, you know I've found a natural inclination towards landscapes um, and where photography started for me towards the end of high school I really loved playing with the camera when we were on holidays and at the end of high school I would say to my dad you know, I'd like to go and study photography and he laughed at me and so when first year came I found myself in a BSc um, in the engineering field and um, I proved to my dad how quickly I could drop out. He then admitted defeat uh, and he bought me a DSLR camera which back then was a, a Canon 400D you know, it was like the kit camera you could find at a macro or a game store um, and he enrolled me in a part-time course and Upon first inspection of the materials, I just saw, well, it's full of spelling mistakes, so it's probably going to be full of technical mistakes. And so I went onto the internet and I saw, well, here's all of this information in so much more detail and it's all for free. 
So I spent two or three years um, where I would just shoot sunset every single day on some beach or a mountain somewhere in the Western Cape. And I'd spend all the rest of my time just posting to online forums, reading up how I can improve my photography, and here we are 13 years later. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting for me because it's the other way around. I shoot people and I can direct it, but you can't direct landscape. <laughs> That's the reason why I work with people. Martin, this, um, this question is a bit more difficult to ask you because you, uh, your work is so varied. I mean, you shoot in so many different disciplines. So let me ask it differently. Why do you shoot landscape photography? So, I was involved uh, a, a lot of my career in studio photography, photographing uh, boring things that people wanted to use for marketing. Mm. Uh, and I spent a lot of my time in the studio uh, under controlled lighting. So, when I made a decision to go into fine art photography, the very first thing I did was to get outdoors. As you know, my work is very varied and uh, I was liked by um, Sean O'Toole, the art critic, when he looked at my work, he described my, my portfolio as, a, as a, um, a shop, a sweet shop. When you walk into a sweet shop and you get licorice all sorts on one side and you get toffee apples on the other side. And he said, it's all sort of you know, very vibrant and all over the place. But he said, at the end of the day, it tends to tie up together. And in fact, that was actually one of the, the, that was one of the things about opening a gallery at that stage, which proved to be uh, successful, was the fact that there was variety. So, so landscape is just part of one of the genres that I shoot, uh, but yeah, there is many, you are right. Mm -hmm. Alright, this question is for both of you, especially in this time of COVID-19 and travel restrictions where people literally can have a journey only in their head. Do you think that landscape photography will get m even more relevant now? Mm. Rafael, what do you, how do you feel? I think so, yes, you know, um, the, the main thing is that now that we're locked up in our homes, I mean, we can move about a bit um, now, but during the hard lockdown, I think that people really realized how important nature is and how much we appreciate nature and not being allowed to go into nature just for a month. I know it drove me completely crazy. Um, and I think landscape photography, all of a sudden people realized that it's, it's the most incredible way to bring nature into your home and get the effect that nature has on you without being able to get out there. Mm. And is that what you want to capture? Yes, I would say, you know, Martin, uh, to give some context to the viewers, we're here in Hart Bay where Martin mm. and Martin live. Um, if you have had a bad day, do you ever go out onto Chapman's Peak to look at the ocean? Sure. sure. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, landscapes and beautiful natural scenery has an incredible effect on the human psyche, it lifts our mood, it makes us, mm. it calms us down, it soothes us, it soothes us. Um, and that's just at any moment in time, you know, if you go out in the middle of the day when the light isn't that great, but there are special moments when the light and the weather and everything just lines up perfectly and moments like that can have a, leave a significant mark on the viewer, you know, we all have stories of when I was 17, I went here or there, and mm. it was the most incredible sunset ever. Um, and my goal is to capture that, moments like that. Now, the problem is that we experience moments like that with all of our senses. Uh, we can see and hear the ocean, you can taste the salt in the air, you can mm. smell the flora, you can feel the waves crashing against the cliffs. But when you take a photo of that, um, you're dealing with only a two-dimensional medium that you experience with only one sense, vision. But if the photographer does everything absolutely perfectly, um, it's possible to capture all of those experiences. Um, a simple example would be you can use slow shutter speed to blur the grass, thereby capturing the wind. If there's a lot of spray hanging above the surf and the sunlight catches it just right, you, it's possible through nostalgia and memory when a person views that photo, that it can trigger certain emotions, it can trigger those senses again, and you can experience that moment and those places through a photo. And the person doesn't have to have been to, say, Hart Bay. He can have a similar memory from somewhere on the Californian coast, mm -hmm. and the photo can awaken those memories that you have of, you know, a different place. Um, and that, I would say, is my goal, is to to capture images like that, landscape photos, the purpose should be 
to be able to experience a place without having been there. Yeah. If I can uh, just come in there just regarding this question. Do you know, I have never seen our uh, nature walk so busy, ever. The mm. cars are lined up like you would not believe. So I think that I, I, I agree that that sense has been heightened for sure. And, and landscape photography, in any case, is, is actually one of the most popular genres that there is. It, it doesn't even have to fight for that position, it's already there. So it's even going to become more popular, both from the buyer's point of view, as well from the photographer's point of view. Mm. Is that why you think that people invest into landscape photography art? I think, uh, you know, um, landscapes right through the history of, of art in all different mediums has always been a popular genre, always. And, you know, and if you look at why that is, I think it's because you're inviting nature into your home. So, so you know, the, the, the positive thoughts that, uh, that we're talking about, that positive energy that, you, that it tends to give that those memories of wonderful places that either you remember you were at or you wish to go to visit, it does all of that, and the bigger they print it, the better they feel. They feel like quite realistic. Mm. So it's, we get quite a few people coming through our gallery uh, when they come and they look around. And if you know, you say, "Can I help you? Is there something you're looking for?" Uh, very often, they're looking for a beautiful landscape. They might say it needs to be desert, or it needs to be ocean, or it needs to be forest, and they may have an idea, but it's landscape. All right. Mm. Okay, then I must ask you this: When I stand in front of your art, both of your art. I cannot but wonder how much Photoshop does go into this kind of work. Mm, great question. In, in my particular style of photography, I'm trying to represent nature and document nature, special moments in nature. Um, and on the one side we have the scene that nature gives us, and on the other side we have the camera trying to capture it. And sometimes the camera gets very, very close to the original scene. Um, and sometimes it doesn't get quite so close. We've got some examples. The waterfall uh, is a simple point where the, the scene was captured by the camera very, very close to what it looked like in reality. Other examples, like the Drakensberg image, was not quite so close to the reality. And there it takes a significant amount of contrast and color to get closer to it. You know. We may think that every time a new camera is released that the technology is incredible, but it is still so far off human vision that it requires different amounts of Photoshop and different photos, but the goal is to represent nature honestly. Um, and we always, I always want to do as little as possible, but sometimes you need to do a fair amount of Photoshop. Mm. Martin, I know your so, answer will be yeah, different. I don't want to fence it here, so I'm, I'm going to be quite clear on this. So, I 100% agree that if you're photographing an area where it is recognizable and you're bringing that forward and delivering that to the viewer, then I think your, your, your limitation to, your, to Photoshop would be based on developing, just like the digital darkroom days. Uh, sorry, like the, the chemical darkroom days. So it would be just like that, where you would come into the computer and you would actually develop that picture up to the best that it can deliver, but no more than that. So I, I understand that you don't want to see Table Mountain upside down and things like that. However, if I can cross over onto the other end of the, the fence and I can just say in my world of art photography, Photoshop is one of the greatest tools that, that we have. It's undermined today because everybody uses, the, or a lot of people use the word Photoshop as if you're cheating. Mm -hmm. So if they see, a, and even if it's a really interesting picture and it's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it's, they will come to you and they'll say, has that been Photoshopped? And my answer there is yes, it's been photoshopped beautifully because, because Photoshop is a wonderful tool for photo editing, but it depends on what your end goal is. So creatively, yes, there's a lot of Photoshop going on in certain of the images, but not all. Mm. Yeah. While we're talking about that, maybe just briefly talk about, let's talk about equipment mm. briefly. Thought we weren't going to do this, <laughs> but you have to just a little bit. So, do you have any favorite equipment, Martin, that you use? For no, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to do I'm going to do the the good thing here, the and I'm going to hand this over to Hochart again, and then I will give you my answer. 
Um, okay, I will give the audience the satisfactory answer and Martin can um, give the philosophical answer. So, <laughs> I shoot on Fuji, but I don't think it matters what you shoot on. What matters is the process, the intent, in the case of landscape photography, the landscape, the light, you know, it's everything that you do with the camera. It's not the camera itself. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. So my answer, mm -hmm. I use a camera that works and I'm not prepared to go much further than that because I think it's, I think too much emphasis gets put on the equipment mm -hmm. and, not on the, and not on the artistic ability and technical ability of the photographer or artist. Yeah. So it's the same as asking a, a painter, tell me which brushes do you use, what oil do you use, what acrylic do you use, that doesn't matter. What you ask is about the, the actual artwork itself. And photography should be no different, mm. as long as it works. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I agree. All right, then maybe more importantly, how do you think digital photography has influenced your work and, and does it matter? I suppose in a way it, it doesn't really matter because I've been, you know, I've come from right through film photography all the way into digital mm. and nothing really has changed. The photographic process still remains the same. But I think the one thing that digital certainly has done for me, it's allowed me to explore more because it's cheaper. So you can take photographs and delete them and donate them back to cyberspace and try all over again. Whereas with film, you would always count your, your money and always double check. And by the time you got your film developed and got it back, you didn't even know whether they were yours in the first place. So, so I think film photography uh, or digital photography has certainly allowed one to explore a lot more. And, uh, and that it's certainly done for me. Okay, Robert, let's maybe talk a little bit about social media versus printing. Um, first of all, you have a lot of followers on Instagram. Do you think it really matters and it, it reflects in the sales? And the second question would be, do you shoot specifically for the one or the other? That's a good question. Um, and I am in, currently in the process, I would say, I'm in the process of trying to switch more to shooting for print than for social media now. The, the first issue is that if you think, you know, about Instagram, the explore tab, where you have all of those little thumbnails where the image is maybe that size. Mm. You're trying to compete for people's attention in that little space. If they open the image up, then you've got that much space. But all in all, people are you know, investing all of this time and effort to present this whole art form that big. And there's a certain recipe that works for that size. It is big bold lines, usually shot on a wide angle lens, bright colors, which can be achieved by either chasing pink sunsets or by oversaturating everything in editing. Um, and the problem is that if you blow that up to a massive size and you put it in a beautiful contemporary space with natural colors, it just looks kitsch and overpowering. Mm -hmm. Now, the image that would look more beautiful in that contemporary space would usually have more subtle colors, would be rich in texture and detail. And conversely, when you shrink that down to that size, it completely disappears. So the trend that I've seen is that photographers who have massive social media followings, let's call it more than 100,000, they don't really sell prints, whether they've tried or not, um, I don't know, but you don't see them selling prints. Mm. And again, conversely, the photographers who are very successful at selling limited edition prints at premium prices often have little to no social media following. So it looks like two entirely different industries. If I had to choose between getting 10,000 likes on a photo versus hanging it in a gallery and getting one sale, I would take the one sale any day. Um, so it's two very different industries, but you know, social media feels a bit superficial to me, whereas the whole gallery and printing thing feels like an authentic enjoyment and engagement with the art. Okay, while we're on the subject, Martin, I have a really good question already from the audience, which fits in here very nicely. Do you think showing your work on social media undermines its value in the gallery space? No, not at all. No, I think social media is a wonderful tool for that. Um, again, you know, Hochhaus mentioned that certain pictures do better on social media, but, but certainly in our gallery space, we, we often get inquiries because of, of uh, you know, photographs posted on Instagram or Facebook or, or what have you. What we do tend to do, though, 
is we try to, to show what the print looks like in that contemporary home uh, where you actually see the end result rather than just the picture. Um, and that normally helps a lot as well, that people can see and, and appreciate the value of what a, a great landscape photograph will do. Mm. It gives you wall. a feeling of the space. Yes, and how yeah. you can use it as well. Yeah. yeah, And normally simplicity breeds success. So. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, but do people literally buy from Insta of Instagram? Yes, yes, absolutely. We do, we do make sales. Um, a lot of our overseas clients who have never been into our gallery do place orders. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the difference between what you see on a social media post to what you see in real life is like chalk and cheese. And, and that emotional contact, when you come into contact with something in a gallery where you see the quality, you see the size, you see the intention, it's much easier to actually make a purchase because you, 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 it's overwhelming and you, you've just got to have that. But I do find people, and, and many times, people who actually buy straight off the website or straight off the online shop, when that print arrives with them and they unroll it for the first time at the picture framer or, you know, and get to see it, we get, we get those sort of comments where they say, oh my God, it is far better than what I ever imagined it to be. And that's the reality of the print. There is no substitute for it. No substitute at all. Um, Hoha, many people have a good camera today and shoot landscapes. So how do you manage to separate yourself? From I've, Martin, I've found over the years that, you know, there are various trends that evolve um, and they usually last about say, two or three years each. And every time that I've tried to chase a trend to try and, you know, stay on the cutting edge, that when that trend fades away, I've got two or three years of work where I altered my shooting style and I altered my editing style because nowadays the trends are a lot to do with editing, where all of a sudden two to three years work is completely outdated and you have to go back and re-edit all of that. And I found that the work that I did while I was not chasing a trend, when that trend fades away, that work is still relevant. Um, there may be highs and lows where if you don't chase the trend and there is something that's very trendy, um, your work sort of falls to the back. But the moment that things go back to normal and people are bored of a trend, then you are at the cutting edge again. So I think that the main thing I've learned over the last 13 years, particularly with landscape photography, is stay true to nature because nature will never go out of fashion. You know, nature is always trending and particularly in a day and age where we are um, destroying more and more of nature, the pristine wilderness that we have left just becomes more and more popular and trendy. So, yeah, I found that stay true to nature and your work will always be relevant. Yeah. And, and Martin, um, how do you know when you have, a, have shot a print that will be released on a gallery wall? What makes you decide? Well, I think, first of all, my, my workflow is a little bit different. Um, to, to many. So let's start with you out there shooting uh, and I suppose your question is how do you know at that point that yes. you've actually, I think it's that little feeling you get in your tummy that that little like the little butterfly thing that says oh my god don't let me screw this one up because you just you just know you're onto something the light has come together uh, it's feeling magic everything is starting to work so so that would be the one thing that would, would put you into sort of, okay, watch out for this one, this, is, this, this could be one. But, but then I lock my pictures away in any case for at least six months when I, um, when I get back from a shoot because I tend to find the emotions are too high. So the fact that you were climbed up halfway up a mountain, the fact that you made it certainly at my age and <laughs> all of that tends to now play a role and you look at the picture and it's got extra value. But once that's subsided, maybe the picture doesn't have that value. So, so at that that's point, at that very point, yeah. Tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm overexcited after yeah. a shoot and, and sit down the next day, and yeah. then you're, yeah, sure. you're right. And you, yeah. you're hot. Do you also get that feeling? Yeah, it's a little bit like being in love. You know, you, <laughs> you know, my my main thing is when I'm on a trip and I'm lying in bed and I keep looking at the images, then I know. That it is something special, but what Martin says is 100% true. You know, sometimes you're so obsessed and sentimental over the effort that you put into the photo, 
Um, but particularly when dealing with nature, sometimes you can shoot a place 10 times and the light will just screw you. Um, mm. And you think you've gotten something amazing because of all the effort you've put in, but yeah. it's not special. And just um, th there are two elements. The one is giving it time for all of those emotions to fade away. And the other one is to, to have a good um, critic who can tell you <laughs> you're being emotional, that photo sucks. Mm, yeah, um, that would have been my next question. Uh, How do you handle critique? Because I, when I studied, I said that before to you, it was so valuable, you know, to have the other artists in uh, mm. discussion with them and, mm. and have the influence of, of other artists. And I think that was very, very valuable. Um, so how do you handle critique? Are you asking me? Yes. Okay, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I... First, first of all, being involved in, in the in the you know sort of the gallery space where you put your work up on the wall for the public to see, the public has become my ultimate critic, mm -hmm. and they yeah, if they like it, they're usually interested and they will buy one or they'll give you a comment. If they don't like it, they walk right past. And if enough people walk right past, then then perhaps there's something there. But um, but so, so critique from that point of view, it, it's, I've sort of got used to that. But I do have my go-to person, who is, uh, of course, Van der Lende, great landscape photographer. He, he has got a very good eye and he's brutally honest, in fact, too honest. But uh, so what I would do is I would send him maybe my top 12, what I think from a trip, and I would leave mm. it with him. And uh, he, uh, he would take a long time to, to come back and then one day I get the call to say, uh, and I'm going to say it in Afrikaans because this is how he says it. It's in my which is my friend, are you sitting down? And I knew, you know, you know, okay, here it comes. And you listen, but you still do not actually agree because that emotion still comes back. But normally, you know, yeah, what, a couple of weeks later, a month later, a year later, two years later, sanity sort of prevails and you more or less start agreeing. But you need that. You, you need that person who can tell you that. And I'm sure you find the same. Yeah, um, you know, one of the most sad things nowadays, especially when I'm trying to teach students, is to try and get them to have someone to go to for critique. When I started out 11, 12 years ago, the process was take a photo, put it online, and all of the photographic communities had a healthy agreement that you would receive constructive criticism on your photos. Um, and nowadays, no one allows that anymore. If you critique someone's photo, even in a positive way on Facebook or Instagram, you get blocked from their account. So I also have a friend like Kurs, um, Alex, he's a British guy. And as, as Martin says, you almost need someone who's too honest, like to the point where they lack social tact, <laughs> um, who will just tell it to you as it is. You know, if mm. there's anything wrong with that photo, they will say it and you will go back to the drawing board. Mm. Uh, but that is just in producing digital photos and then there's, as Martin says, the next level where you print it and you hang it on the wall. Oh, yes. And the potential, buy, the potential buyer is the ultimate critic. If they love it, they will buy it. If they do not love it, um, you know, if they like it, they'll look at it, comment on it. But uh, it's the people who just walk right past that <laughs> it's a diff mm. difficult pill to swallow. Um, and I'm, I'm newer to the process, whereas Martin has decades of experience with that. Mm. Uh, but, yeah. but there's still vulnerability, which... Yeah, there is, and I, I want, to, want to also mention that the print is the ultimate critic as yeah. well, so let me bring that in here now. The moment you put ink on paper, you would have, I'm sure that you've, you've experienced this as well, but the moment you print something and you look at it, it's the ultimate policeman. It shows you everything you did right, but it flashes everything you did wrong, right down to the smallest error that you made in your processing, it will show it to you. Mm. And I think that's the one thing that I certainly... Uh, you know, when I talk about photographers coming into the industry or people wanting to get into photography, there is just so many that shoot pictures and they live on cyberspace mm. and they never really ever get to hang on a wall where they can be seen in all, all their fame and glory. And I think that's quite sad. Yeah. Mm. It and it is such a nice feeling as well if you frame your own artwork. Oh, you haven't made a mistake then. It's like <laughs> <a> nice <laughs> If, you, if you've made a mistake, it's a very expensive feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
So do you, Martin, I'm, this is also a question for both of you, but do you follow the rules or guidelines when it comes to composition? I see you very carefully use the word guidelines and well done to you for that. <laughs> um, no, look, I, I think they're very important, but as you know, I, I, I would rather not call it a rule because I tend to find a rule is binding. Yeah. So if you want to change a rule, you've got to call in a whole group of people and you've got to vote against it and then a new rule replaces that. But it's still a rule. So I think a guideline is probably a better, a better way. And, and I think also these guidelines, certainly they work. I don't know if you agree with me, Arthur, but they actually do work. And that's because they've been passed down through art through ages. So there's certain things that we know that if we do, we're going to have a better chance of actually presenting our work before public. So I think they need to be respected. Um, again, I'll use Quercia as an example. One day when we were discussing this over a, a bottle of wine, he said to me, and it is, I, I've never forgotten this, he said to me, as far as it comes to the rules of composition, he said it's pretty much like... Um, like the law, he said, if you if you if you live by the law, you'll or, sorry live, live by the law, you will be judged by the law. Mm. Mm. And he said, so he would rather respect the law, but live under grace. And I think that's such a su such a nice way of tying it up. So I think if you want to be creative, you want to make your your own name, you want to build your own sort of feel to the picture. That's fine, but just you know respect those guidelines. Uh, many people say they want to be revolutionaries when it comes to composition. They want to rewrite the history books of composition. Well, that might be true, but perhaps you need to just go and find out and learn what you are, re you, you, yes, what you are revolting against right. before yeah. you actually go and create this re revolution. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. Hmm. And how about for you, rules, guidelines? Um, I, I think what Martin said is very important that people need to figure out what they want to revolt against at first. You know, the interesting thing for me was that because I was self-taught, I didn't read up so much on composition. It was only when I had to start teaching people that I saw, well, okay, everything that's written here in this, in this book is what I've been doing the whole time. Uh, and I think that anyone who gets to the point where they can make a living from photography, they have an inherent talent for composition. You know, and mm. people see it as this set of rules that someone established that you have to follow. And I don't think that is what happened. I think that mm. people with a talent for composition and for art follow certain natural guidelines for design. Mm. And people analyzed that and figured it out and established the rules of composition mm. according to what was naturally happening. And, and it's exactly as Martin says, and I see it um, in a lot of people, they want to break the rules before they know what the rules are. You have to master the rules in order to break them. There's always a technical justification Agreed. according to a rule for why you can break the rule, um, either through space, negative space or symmetry or some rule like that. Uh, so the rules are very important. Uh, they can be broken, but you need to understand what it is that you are breaking. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I understand. It's, it's, I also put in a question here from the audience I've, I got earlier, but I think it fits here quite nicely. Did you always have an eye for framing a landscape or is it developing by continuously shooting? If you can answer that. I think there's a, a foundation of natural sense for composition. Mm. There's definitely, um, you know, I think people have biases that you have a foundation and then you have certain biases that drive you in the wrong direction where you do need a little bit of feedback and it comes back to having a critic to tell you, you could have composed that in a better way or, you know, maybe you should have shot wider or tighter. There's an element that doesn't add to the narrative of that photo. So... You know, people are born with, or whether it's nature or nurture, but you have a certain foundation and you need to nurture it, add to it, and get um, critique on it. Uh, but then again, there's a dangerously fine line of being too influenced by other people and losing your natural style. Mm. Um, but yes, develop it uh, and get feedback on it. Okay, Martin, do you, do you go out and shoot for an art collection specifically? And what's your approach there? Do you have a specific idea? No, I've, I'm quite strange when it comes to that. I, I've, I've always said that I'm a, I'm a painter trapped in a photographer's body. But because of that, uh, I have maybe 
20, 30 projects going on in my head all at once. So no, I don't do that. I tend that, that tends to put me in a controlling position. And when I try to control it, I mess it up. So I would rather go and shoot with an open slate and say, okay, what is there here that I can find? What is there that talks to me? And I'll photograph that. And then if I see something that is starting to work, I say, oh, yeah, that, that's beautiful. That we're going to put into the boundary line collection, you know, mm. or, or that's going into complex simplicity. And I've always been said that the names I give photographs are, are, are really good in comparison to what I shoot. So that's one of my <laughs> critics who told me that. So, but that, so that's all running around in my head at, 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 at one given time. So no, not at all. So do, do you choose then a specific location, for instance, where you go and say, yeah. okay? Well, I, I, do, I do a bit of homework on a location to find out that, that, you know, that space is actually a nice area to go and shoot. And, uh, and I try not to visit the same location twice because I tend to find that that again will put me in a position where I'm going in trying to create something that I already know is possible, whereas I want to rather just respond to what is there. So, um, the, the, yeah, the, the one little trick, uh, I suppose I shouldn't really be, be even discussing this, but the one little trick, and you must remember I'm involved in art photography, not just landscape photography. So, so I, think, I think I'm looking at it from a broader spectrum, but if I get to a little town, the first place you go and ask for, for opinion on, on what is in the area, what they to find, is the pub. The barman knows everything, absolutely everything. You take your phone, you say, this is what I do, check, have a look, have a look, is there anything around here that looks like this? And, and especially like that old abandoned collection, you say, yes, this farmer's got a that and this, and you know, suddenly you start to understand the area better and you know where to start go looking and hunting. Wow. Interesting, yeah. And I pass that on to you, Horat, with another question on top of that, because it fits in all together. So, how, how do you feel about other prints shot from the same location? Well, that is a, a touchy subject. Firstly, uh, you know, when I started, when I or, or when I was exploring a lot, I was in a very lucky position that there weren't many landscape photographers in South Africa, if you compare it to, say, England, where every single rock has been photographed from every angle. Uh, and so I was able to, through not too much effort, discover a lot of the iconic places um, in South Africa, particularly on the coastline. And there are a lot of people who go out and take that same photo and it's not a, it's not a nice feeling if people go and, you know, there's a little bit of a humbling feeling and there's a little bit of a, uh, the plagiarizing me feeling. But I am equally guilty of going and shooting a lot of places that other people shot before me. Mm -hmm. uh, and Martin had a, you know, he was making a point about all art is influenced by some other art. So we're very lucky in Africa that we still have so many places that can be discovered. Uh, and I always try to say to people, you know, try and make an effort to find something unique uh, because there's, it's, there's a certain sense of exploration and discovery that excites us. Mm -hmm. And seeing a new location for the first time, if you are the first person to photograph something, there is a lot of value to that um, in showing people a place for the first time. So it's worth the effort, but most of the time, or I think it's the same as with the compositional rules, you can't go and break the rules if you haven't mastered them first. So go and learn the technical side first at the iconic locations and then try to look for something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's just uh you know, where we were talking uh, earlier before the actual show, we were talking about um, exactly this. And there is a, a wonderful book called Steal Like an Artist. Yeah. It's, uh, and I, f forgive me, but I, I can't remember the author's name, but you'll be able to, be able to find it on the internet. And it talks about ex exactly that, is, 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 is going and getting the best out of everything, but then taking all of that and making it your own. So I think when somebody goes and copies a composition from corner to corner, from you know, trying to make something almost the same or even better than the original person, I suppose there I would have a little bit of an issue because I think one can make, a, make a, a, an attempt to actually make it your own. Mm. But, you, but at a certain point, you've got to break away from that fold and you've got to go and, and try to do something yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, um, what, I, what I mentioned earlier about, you know, experiencing a landscape and then trying to capture it 
the, that I believe is the original organic process with landscape photography, with landscape paintings before that, is you go and spend time there. The landscape makes an impression on you and you try to communicate that to the viewer. And the problem that we have with photography being so popular is that I think 90% of landscape photos being taken, there's none of that organic process. People are just trying to copy a photo that they've seen. And as Martin says, there are varying degrees on it, you know. We may see a location that we really love, go to it, and then try to find our own interpret interpretation of it. And the other side is I've seen people going to Deadfly in Namibia and they have a print or a, the photo on their iPad and they go and they shuffle around and they look until they find that exact composition where there is zero creative process involved and, and that's not right. And over the years I've had luck with various locations where I've gone to a place that I saw a photo of, got something slightly different. And there are other places like Deadfly where I was lucky enough to so, go there for the first time. Now I arrived at this place, you think, how the hell am I going to get a unique shot? And I thought, I'm not going to, so let me rather just enjoy the place. So I walked past the trees, I just found a place to chill against the dune. When everyone was done shooting, I got up, I walked around, I saw, here's this amazing pattern in the clay pan. Mm -hmm. um, and I photographed that, and that turned out, even to this day, I think I shot it nine years ago, is still one of my most popular photos. Um, but sometimes you stumble upon unique locations with a bit of luck. Uh, other times it takes a lot of hard work. But what I, what I think I can close that off on is it is so worth the effort finding a unique location that no one has shot. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it is extremely rewarding. And that's what I think one of the important lessons I can pass along is for people to stop copying other shots and try and find something unique and make it their own. So, so one of the greatest photographers that ever walked this planet, Mr. Ansel Adams, said if ever you want to learn how to take a good photograph, learn where to place your camera. But he didn't say, place your camera exactly where somebody else did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, maybe let's do a quick game, some, some quick questions, quick answers. Um, very easy. So, if you had a choice, film or digital? All right, I'm going to throw this back at you. So, so if you had a choice, strawberries and cream, which one would you prefer? Both. You just answered my question. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For you. Uh, if I could get someone to do all of the development and the scanning and the cleaning, um, and if film was free, then film. Otherwise, digital. Sorry, okay. digital. All right. Compromise and get the shot or walk away? Walk away. I think that's, uh, I think for certainly, yeah, no, walk away. Come back on another day. Always walk away. Don't compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, you will have to sleep with that compromise. And <laughs> it's not comfortable. <laughs> Never sleep with a compromise. <laughs> Evening or morning light? Um, I always argue with people that it makes no difference if they try to tell me that the morning is this or the evening is that. Um, there are definitely certain factors involved, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay uh, on the fence here and say it doesn't matter. And Martin? Evening light. I think uh, evening light for me tends to linger longer. It seems to stay around a bit longer. And also, I think at the end of the day, there's a lot more dust and pollution or whatever in the sky. And so the light tends to be a little bit warmer. But uh, yeah, I won't fence it. I'm going to go evening. <laughs> All right. Mm. Overriding factor, composition or light? I'm going to sit on the fence again, both equally important. Mm, sure. OK. You're putting me in such a predicament, but it's fine. Uh, no light. Definitely light. I think light is the secret ingredient in, in great landscape photographs. And sometimes composition needs to be made around what's happening with lighting. So okay. light for me comes first, composition second. All right, interesting. Mm. Sharp or blurred? Or what? Rather a blurred photo of a good concept than the other way around. Yeah, because some people are far too obsessed with the technical side and they completely neglect the artistic side and you have perfectly focused and exposed photos of something so mundane. Yeah, we come back to Mr. Adams here who said uh, there's nothing he likes worse than 
than seeing a, a sharp picture of a fuzzy concept. And I shoot a lot of fuzzy concepts, so, <laughs> so yeah. But you shoot a lot, at least. Yeah, but, but let me also say it's one or the other. So there's no fence sitting here when it mm. comes to, yeah, so you've got, you know, a, a picture that was meant to be sharp, which is slightly blurred, is an error. So it either you do a proper job at blurring and, and use that artistically, or you do a proper job at shooting it sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, location, international or local, and why? Oh, local. Local, I think just, uh, if, even as an artist, it's just a, f it's a lot easier to work locally where you, you know your heritage is and you understand everything. Um, I have shot a little bit overseas and I, I think probably my most successful country where I've actually shot a little bit of work is Scotland but I tend to find it it's, it's absolutely beautiful it's breathtaking but it feels very uh, how do you put it chocolate boxy to me uh, mm -hmm. it's almost too perfect and I think our landscape over here is just so diverse and so rugged Uh, it just, it, for me, it just, it, I'd rather shoot local. Mm. And Hochart, with your Iceland pictures, I saw them, they're amazing. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, if you're trying to compete on a global stage, we may think you're in Cape Town, you go to Global Strand, and mm. you see another three photographers, and mm. I've got a lot of competition. But you go to a place like Iceland, to the beach with the, with the glacial ice on it, and on the morning with terrible weather, they are... 50 photographers there, all with a big tripod, filter system, serious photographers. Uh, last year I was in Patagonia and we had the same thing. It was this perfect morning. It's a two hour uphill hike from town. And there were about 50 photographers there that went to that effort to capture that place. Um, and, and it ties in again to what I said earlier about the merit of finding a unique landscape that no one has ever seen before. And in Africa, we have that in crazy abundance. You know, things have changed a lot over the last 10 years with it becoming such a popular hobby, but we still have so much. If you look at Namibia, you know, everyone's so obsessed with sources of clay that they just go there. And all around it, you have these, uh, like a, just a treasure trove of unique shots waiting to be discovered. So for me, locally, definitely. And I traveled a lot over the last 10 years and The feedback that I got from those photos just tell me focus on Africa because the Africa photos just get so much more attention from the global community. Mm. All right, last one of the uh, quick questions with the not so short answers. Um, do you shoot for yourself or for an audience that might buy? Do you know, I think the only time I shoot for an audience is when I'm trying to create work for the gallery for visitors who, who come to Cape Town or come to South Africa. Then I have in mind maybe iconic places of Cape Town or iconic places that mm. they may would, would that they would like a photograph. But, but that's to put bread on the table more than anything else. But besides that, no, absolutely not. I think that again comes down to the controlling factor and then you go in trying to actually shoot for something that you think you should be getting and you're missing what's actually happening. So while you're shooting this way, everything's happening behind you and you're missing it. So no, not with an audience. No, I photograph purely for, for um, myself and I'll decide later how I'm going to work with those images. All right. And uh, I would say, you know, it's, it's both a blessing and a curse is that everyone who do, does landscape photography as a hobby, mm -hmm. um, so many of them give their images away for free that they've devalued landscape photos. So whereas 10 years ago, I used to make a lot of money from my landscape photos and I had to shoot for clients and what the market demands. Uh, and as that happened, both Martin and I switched over more to teaching. But what that's done that's wonderful is that I don't make money from my photos anymore. And because of that, I can shoot whatever the hell I want. Um, so I find that I'm very seldom shooting for anything that anyone specifically wants. I'm shooting 100% what I want to, um, and that, that has been a wonderful liberation over the last few years. And I will bet you anything you want, when you look back in the years to come at your career, it's at that time that your best work has come. Yeah. Mm, I'll bet you. Mm. Mm. And um, we got two more really nice questions from the audience. The one is uh, for both of you. 
Do you set goals for yourself and do you have a bucket list of locations or do you chase the light? Okay. Uh, so I have a little black book of locations, some I have not been to and I have to go to, some are places that I've saw on trips and I didn't get the light and I need to go back to. Uh, so, you know, in terms of chasing the light, you plan a trip in the right season, you go to the place and you always budget a bit of time at each location to work with the variable of light. So, whereas, you know, there's a big element of chasing the light, it's more like sitting around and waiting for the light. So it's a very passive process of chasing the light. Um, but, but yes, there are many locations that I go back to, but you'll often find that, you know, the first time you saw a location, it wasn't a specific type of light. You go there and now you get completely different light, perhaps what you often have is you are planning a shoot a shot in that direction and then the magic happens in that direction and you end up finding something completely different at the same location so sometimes nature throws you a curveball and you catch it and by random luck you get an amazing shot so sometimes it's planned sometimes it's luck uh, but yes there are so there's definitely a bucket list of locations yeah also a bucket list um I try not to visit the same location twice, as I have said, I tend to find that I get a little bit jaded if I do that, so I like to go in to a, a, a situation which I haven't seen, and I think you see it with new eyes, it's, it's almost like, I don't know if you've been at home for a long period of time, like we have in lockdown, you get so used to what's in your home that you don't really see it, and then you maybe go away on a holiday and you come back a month or two later, or if you're that lucky and you walk in and suddenly you notice, you know what, the pot plant is actually dead. And the color <laughs> yellow that I painted on the wall is like extremely bad. And now you see these things for what they are. So I tend to find in my photography that's the sort of approach I prefer. Is once you see things with new eyes and you haven't seen them before, I think my creativity sort of works better there. All right, so then we have one last question for you guys from Tyron. Uh, he said, I know we don't want to talk too much about gear, but have you ever got a new piece of equipment that excited you so much for a shoot? Yes, I would say every time that I get a, you know, that I only upgrade gear about every five or six years, but every time it's such a revolutionary change that you know you're capturing so much detail. And the first thing I think is, well, I can print this so much bigger and there will be so much more detail in the print. And then every time that does give me a bit of a boost to, it sort of gives me a little, you know, push to go out and get back there. It does really motivate me to some extent. Yeah. Mm. There's nothing like the smell of a new camera. <laughs> yeah, it really isn't. <laughs> it's just, it's just, even when you open the box, it's a special moment. So, so I think that that happens naturally regardless. Yeah. 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 Mm. And um, one more thing, what's your most successful print or prints? The, the waterfall, mm. definitely the waterfall, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I must say I, I really enjoy that, that shot of yours very much and, and uh, now that we're representing your work, it's actually that photograph yeah. and the one in Sorcerer's Flay that you spoke about with the upside down tree. With the yeah. tree. It looks like an upside or a tree laying down. Those two get the most amount of views, so mm -hmm. quite crazy. Now, I think for me, the uh, funny enough, the most successful print in the gallery of mine is an abstract photograph, yeah, and it's it's a it's a Which complete one? and pure abstract. Okay, forgive me, but the name is long. It's Analogious Anthology, and I can hardly even spell it. But <laughs> but yeah, uh, you did not. No, and it's it's a photograph of the underside of fishing boats, which I've put into a. Uh, which I put into a photo montage to look like an old Dutch harbour with little inlets coming in and yachts yeah. floating around. You've got to have a little bit of creativity, maybe a couple of glasses of wine and you get to see it. <laughs> but that's actually has been the number one selling print. And the second, which is special to me, is, is the abandoned number one, which started off that whole abandoned collection. So Yeah. Yeah, and that uh, with, the, with the old, um, the car on the pole and... Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that has always remained special to me. And is there um, a measure of success for your landscape photography? Oh, I would say definitely if someone buys the print, mm. then, then it's been successful for me. Um, there's, there's so much emotion involved as we spoke about, you know, putting a lot of work and emotion into a photo 
we think that that is the measure of success and we tie a lot of emotion to a photo because of that but I think at the end of the day you know if someone is willing to spend the money to put it up on their wall and look at it for 10 years or put it in a drawer and hope that it appreciates in value then I would say that's the ultimate measure of success yeah I agree it's always a humbling experience always a humbling experience when somebody invests in something that you have done which you love doing what next for you guys? What can we look forward to? Um, I've been very distracted over the last few years uh, with another business for everyone who does photography as a hobby. And that is finally getting to the point where someone else is doing most of the work. Uh, so I haven't been doing much in the way of original shooting over the last few years. And my bucket list book has gotten a lot longer and I'm looking forward to getting back to shooting a lot of original work. And then in the new partnership with Martin, I'm really, really looking forward to not just, you know, when I get a new photo posted on social media, like, 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 and it's gone and forgotten in cyberspace, but rather printing it, putting it on a wall and inviting people to come and look at the print in proper lighting, in proper size. Um, yeah, that's a very exciting prospect for me. Great. And Martin? Oh, well, we've... Um we are moving our gallery, we're actually in the process of moving our gallery from Greenpoint now to Woodstock. We've got a beautiful location in Woodstock on the main street. So we're busy shop fitting at the moment, getting the gallery space ready. I'm hoping to do a show of Hohart's work. We tried to do that before COVID turned up, but uh, that didn't help us. So, so once this is all blown over and we're able to return back to some sort of normality, we'd like to give, give that show. And I'd, I'd, be excited about that and then of course the abandoned book that mm, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we did a short print run and then uh, uh, we decided to pull it off it wasn't actually uh, exactly what I wanted so we are close now to to printing and then launching the book so between the gallery and the book Pohot's work and whatever COVID-19 has to still offer <laughs> that's what's next Great, guys. Thank you so much. Good luck, Hohart, with your Thanks original. You I will definitely be there. And good luck to you. We will always stay in contact. Absolutely. And um, maybe just for everyone out there, have a look at the website. Uh, there's some hopefully nice discussions coming on. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, have a good day. <laughs>